Hello, and welcome to the show Gold Squadron Gays. It's the podcast where two Star Wars loving gays break down each episode of their favorite Star Wars TV shows while also being gay as hell. I'm your host, Bradley Brower. I'm your other host, Charles Rogers. And yeah, we're doing books today. <laughs> Thanks, yes, we are. Bradley. I don't want to set up like, because we did this, this on the last episode, I don't want to set up on a Bradley's stupid introduction he tries to make me corpse with, like always becomes the end clip. However, they are getting progressively more funny. Yeah, I'm thinking about it because I was like, I love just doing the random funny stuff that we accidentally do sometimes at the end. But then also sometimes I want to like think, hmm, if I come up with something clever enough to do in the beginning, I should always be putting that at the end. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It, sometimes it'll be that. And sometimes it'll be. Getting a regular paycheck is in fact making you more funny. Uh, I, guess I think so. that is what's going on here. Or maybe uh, it's the mood that I'm in that because we're about to talk about one of my favorite characters ever for like the yes. next 30 to 45 minutes. So, so we are uh, filling some time between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Andor. Hi there, it's Charles from the future. Depending on where Bradley chooses to put this addendum, uh, you're either going to notice some weird cuts in the forthcoming episode, or this has presently dropped in to cut something out. What happened was we recorded this Dark Disciple episode literally one day before the Andor uh, release date push was announced on Good Morning America. So we had a whole plan that we had set up for how we were going to break down the next couple of weeks. That plan has had, now had to go completely out the window. Uh, we don't have anything to announce at time of me recording this. We know we're going to cover Lego Summer Vacation at some point before Andor. We're just not sure when, and we're not sure how we're going to fill the remaining weeks. So keep an eye on our Twitter Keep an eye on our social medias and keep an eye on future episodes. We will let you know as soon as we got as we as soon as we have something. Thank you so much for understanding. We hope you enjoy this discussion or have been enjoying this discussion of Dark Disciple. And if you're just joining us, we just finished a massive three-part series analyzing Rogue One to fucking death, mm -hmm. um, which apparently people quite enjoyed. I got a lot of feedback on that series. Really? Awesome. Really? Couple of things Charles fucked up. We're not going to get into them, but they're there. Never trust any podcast <laughs> ever. <laughs> when somebody says something on a podcast, you should always double check and do your own research generally we try to research as best as possible but we don't always succeed but we do have a handful of things charles fucked up not very many and none that were big enough to mention uh but the thing that i think was the coolest was someone pointed out to me on twitter and i showed you this broadly that in 1977 they printed toys with the death star upside down on the box and it's the only other time we've seen the Death Star upside down. Someone showed me this on our Twitter. It's on our Twitter if you go back through it. I was like, that is the coolest thing I've seen. Yeah, because I remember when we, you know, we're watching when you watch the movie, it is kind of jarring. You're like, why why, why is, is it Death upside, Star down? upside down? Yeah, I've never seen. I mean, then again, there's no upside down in space, but still, it's 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 just orientation-wise, we always see it artwork, everything, where it's like up. <laughs> the laser's <It's> up. up. <laughs> so what we're saying is that the Death Star is a verse top. Yes, clearly. Okay. Some, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's on the bottom. Very rarely. Very on, rarely. On birthdays. On birthdays, on birthdays and special occasions. Top. But we are, we've got a couple of more weeks to fill. And I actually suggested, because we had some lovely chats about the Thrawn books, but the other big one that Bradley, I wanted you to read was Dark Disciple. And we hadn't had a chance to talk about Dark Disciple. I know we we mentioned maybe tacking it onto the Thrawn episode. And then that episode was two hours and 40 minutes of raw recording. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. So I was like, mm, probably, shouldn't, probably shouldn't be mixing things uh, in this. So Yeah, in, anyway, uh, thank you, Claudia, for coming on for that. Please listen to RuPaul's Pod Race and the Mystery Spotcast, but don't go watch Supernatural 
<laughs> uh, they are very clear about that point. But yeah, but before we dived into it, because we're doing Andor and then The Bad Batch and then probably straight in Amanda season three, I wanted to try to drag Bradley aside and, and put him on the spot and talk about some Dark Disciple. This is not the first time I've talked about Dark Disciple on a podcast. I've done this before on First Steps, the Star Wars podcast, but Bradley hadn't read the book at the time. So Bradley, what did you think of Dark Disciple, the Asajj Ventress book? So first of all, love. Um, anything that description wise starts off as Dark Disciple is a canon novel starring Asajj Ventress and Quinlan Voss. Love that. No, I, I love expanding the Asajj Ventress character because she truly is one of the most interesting characters in Star Wars, as well as one of the mo more interesting female characters in Star Wars. And people don't give her enough credit. I feel like people sleep on Asajj Ventress way too much and she's just so good like every every aspect of her she also came at a time when star wars was very like because she is from the original clone wars like project the original right. clone wars multimedia project before clone wars the show was even a thing we've talked about her in the clone wars series and she was one of the first like big prominent evil ladies that I could think of that that got a little more mainstream appeal because of the Star Wars micro series there were others uh Lumia being a big one but Bradley's giving me that blank glassed over look that he gives me whenever I mention something from Legends I think Asajj was one of our first sort of villainous ladies that you could reasonably assume that kids on the schoolyard also knew about. If I mentioned Natasi Dalla on the schoolyard, uh, chances are good. Yep, Bradley just immediately goes asleep. Yep, he is falling, <laughs> falling asleep. Um, wake up, bitch. <laughs> 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 no, and I, I think one of the most interesting things that Clone Wars did with her, the show, was it sort of altered her storyline from what it was in the original multimedia project, because she's basically just evil all the way up to the end, and then she kind of decides she's sick of this shit and pieces out. She die, fake dies in Obi-Wan's arms and then, like, runs away to be like, I'm done with you people. Clone Wars actually gave her an arc, and this book is the conclusion of that arc. And... Um, I did read, so this you can correct my knowledge of this because I don't have super. Oh, are we gonna do meta knowledge. trivia? Are we well, gonna, I was gonna do say meta you can, trivia? You can tell me my knowledge. Uh, so I know this was this book was supposed to be in Clone Wars or something. Correct. Some aspect of it was supposed to be in Clone Wars. I don't know to the extent of it, but oh, I, all of I it. Just know. Oh, basically okay. well, all of it. The whole this story. book. So a little background on Dark Disciple, when Clone Wars was canceled uh, at the conclusion of season five, some of the episodes that were either done or mostly done were picked up by Netflix to broadcast as The Lost Missions. Some of the other episodes that were in development at the time were released through the Clone Wars Legacy Project in various forms. So you had some of the that were released as story reels. Bad Batch, which is no longer canon, it's replaced by the, the actual Clone Wars ep uh, Bad Batch episodes we got in season seven. Crystal Crisis on Utah Power both released as story reels. Uh, the Darth Maul arc was adapted as Son of Dathomir. And then they were planning an eight-part story arc called Dark Disciple. It was going to be half a fucking season of nothing but this. That's it awesome. is eight episodes long, and it was written or was developed by uh, Katie Lucas, who is George Lucas's daughter, wow. who actually um, wrote most of the Asajj Ventress episode. So they hired a woman named Christy Golden to write. Uh, did you do any research on Christy Golden, Bradley? No, I mean, I, I know who does the audiobook, but I don't know anything about the author. Okay, so I'll tell you about the author, and then how about you tell me who, who did the audiobook? Sure. We'll split the duties on this. So the, okay, author of the, book, the author of the book is Christy Golden. Uh, Christy Golden, big, big IP writer. You name an IP, Christy Golden has written for it. She has been in this game for a decade, writing IP novels. Uh, she's written books for Warcraft. She's currently one of the cinematic writers for Warcraft. Um, one of the best parts of that writing staff. I have a complicated relationship with Warcraft, but I do think everything she writes for it is very, very, very good. She's an excellent writer. She's written Star Wars books before. She wrote some of the Fate of the Jedi books. Now, I'm personally mad at those books because they did give my teenage crush, Ben Skywalker, a canon romantic interest who is a girl. And this did briefly 
really ruined my life. Uh, however, I do not hold this against the authors of the books or the quality of Fate of the Jedi. Yeah. Uh, so she's been writing. She also wrote uh, Inferno Squadron. Uh, so she wrote the Battlefront 2 tie-in novel, Inferno Squadron, uh, which tells the story of Aiden Versio versus the Partisans. A uh, very interesting book. So she's written a lot of Star Wars. She is excellent. And this is very important knowledge about Christy Golden. She does own two cats. Uh, okay. They are named Sylvanas and Anduin uh, after the faction leaders in the Battle for Azeroth expansion, which was the first expansion for Warcraft that she was actually employed by Blizzard to help write for. That is just a fun fact about her. She has two cats named after characters that she's worked with. Okay. Um, my knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons is very low, so I okay, don't so these know are different what you're talking things, about. Bro. Um, okay, I, I hear I hear Chris from Dark Side Diva scratching at my window, trying to get it in to throttle Bradley for saying that. <laughs> These are different fantasy franchises, Bradley. I understand that you had sex, and thus you may not know the difference. Oh, uh, okay. However, uh, <laughs> some of us had sex later in life. Gotcha, in our 30s. And thus yeah. learned the difference. Uh, Sir, oh my god, I hate you so much. Uh -uh. I hate you so much. That is uh, not that is that is a joke, folks. <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, uh, she's probably written a Dungeons and Dragons IP thing. It's, I know she, I think she's written for 40k. Mm, uh, Christy uh, Golden. While I'm googling this, why don't you tell me, uh, who narrated the audiobook? Oh, yeah. So, one of the reasons why I actually enjoyed this book, other than the fact that it was. Was Asajj Ventress um, was the fact that it was narrated because I always listen to the audiobooks now. Um, it was narrated by Mark Thompson, who many of you may know as like I guess he he basically owns Star Wars Disney audiobooks at this point. I'm sure, I, I would assume he does he because he is one of the main time. guys that they go to. Uh, <laughs> right. He narrated he narrated he narrates all the Thrawn books. Yep. He narrates uh, all the adult High Republic books. Uh, he showed up to Celebration every single day in jedi robes with a lightsaber trucked it around to every panel very beautiful man uh just awesome awesome dude i got to hear him on several panels and, and dude loves star wars well i enjoy listening to his voice <laughs> so um anytime it's a mark thompson read novel i feel like i am engaged more in the novel versus any other one so i i appreciate it uh the only other time i felt like it was fine for me was when I read the Phasma book and it was voiced by a, a woman. So it, that one, I was like, it was, you know, it had a different inner voice to me. So that's why I liked it uh, versus this one, which is, I like his take on different character voices that he does because eventually they all start to sound the same. And then you're just like, that's the so-and-so voice that he does. That's mm -hmm. the so-and-so voice. And I, I love it. His Lena So voice sounds exactly like his Thrawn voice. Oh, they all reuse voices, though. I mean, that's sort of the nature of the gig. Yeah, you, you got to kind of reuse voices. Uh, I did quickly Google to see if um, if Christy Golden had written anything set in a Dungeons and Dragons inspired universe. It doesn't appear so. Um, she has written basically every good World of Warcraft book. Uh, so for my Warcraft fans out there, uh, she wrote all the good ones. Uh, and Richard A. Knack wrote all the bad ones. There's my coming in hot take about a franchise Bradley doesn't care about. Uh, she's also written a bunch of Star Trek books. She's written Starcraft. She's written Assassin's Creed novels. And here's a fun fact about her. She was born, according to her Wikipedia page, in Atlanta, Georgia. Huh. Well, so I'm going to just hop on down, you know, to her house, wherever <laughs> she lives, you know, and just feel but like, she's hey. not there. She's not there anymore, but. Well, well lucky her. Bradley, um, Bradley was just going to show up and personally thank her for Dark Disciple. That's right. I was just going to get her to sign my uh, my iPhone and be like, thank you so much for the audiobook." <laughs> I guess. We, we do not endorse that. Uh, tracking tracking down authors in real life that is bad yeah please don't do that speaking as a writer i would prefer if, if fans of my work do not personally show up at my apartment that right. would be extremely weird maybe we'll get her to sign a book for you at a convention or something bradley yeah i'll just keep it on my shelf and then just never open it something like that but that was a lot of digression on on the two people that are responsible mainly for the book getting into bradley's ears the author christy yes. golden 
and narrator Mark Thompson. Uh, but I want to ask Bradley, you know, just on in terms of the character of Asajj, how did you feel about sort of this as, as a conclusion to her arc? I know you really loved her in Clone Wars. And this was sort of you getting to experience the long teased, long me harassing you about ending of that story. Did it live up to your expectations? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, <clears throat> here's my thing. I It still follows you know, our classic Star Wars trope of you have to, once you redeem yourself, you have to die, Um, which I'm not a fan of, uh, as you know, but I still feel like it did a good enough job to expand the character and give her life and other ways the show might not have done. I mean, the show kind of started to do it. I think in the beginning um, of Clone Wars, it was very basic Asajj Ventress. She was just the villain. She's just the antagonist the whole time, you know, Um, whenever they could couldn't do Grievous or they couldn't do Dooku or whatever. It was just when like, they whoever, needed yeah. somebody to do a lightsaber fight. Right. They're exactly. like, we, we, we need lightsabers now. Okay. Let's get the evil lady. Exactly. Um, because she looks cool. Her character design is cool. And so they're just like, Oh yeah, let's show her fighting Anakin. Ha <laughs> ha. That's great. Um, However, towards the end, you know, when she kind of becomes a bounty hunter and she kind of starts doing other stuff and she even has that little moments with like Ahsoka and stuff, you're just like, oh, this is interesting. I want to know more about this character. I want to mo- see her more do other things than just be evil lady number seven. You know what I mean? Um, so I like that she has change in her character she has development and then in this book you know they go one step further and go look she also likes to fuck people like, <laughs> you know it's in like, fairness in fairness i would also fuck quinlan boss true but my point is you know you look at her character very stereotypically she is you know the cold heart woman who never is going to get a man because she's just evil and she's whatever you know but in this you're like she likes flirting but it's like a power thing for her yeah like she's not actually interested right until she meets the one you know who changes her and then that person is a strapping young man who dabbles in the dark side once in a while well one thing i really appreciated about the novel was they didn't go the route of saying she meets a man and then like he fixes her right that's not the route she retains her agency through every step of the story when she's hooking up with quinlan that is her choice they never play it as she was so cold and distant but then a man came and solved her problems and melted her cold heart penis. <laughs> like she retains her agency and her choice and her personality even when she's with him she's the same person she doesn't have to change herself to be with a man she is who she is and she meets this partner who is willing to work with that and that's why that works and it's also so tragic in the end when she fucking dies for no reason yeah that's the only part i that don't like sit, that yeah that's the only part that didn't sit well with me was the ending of this because i feel i mean look i understand i know what happens in revenge of the sith like i i get it i know that's how dooku dies but like for me i think the better story is for asajj to get revenge you know on dooku by killing him and then realizing it's not really what i wanted the whole time was i didn't really want to get revenge on him i didn't really want to kill him because in the end it doesn't matter like killing him is not going to change the past things that he did to her or you know how he made her feel and you know all this stuff i would have liked to see that kind of story versus she just so you wanted Riva. yes i did actually <laughs> you wanted yeah. Riva again i wanted Riva again um because Which, no, they what? have similar plots you know i mean something similar they're relatively similar plots, right kind of there are kind enough of, differences yeah. that they're very distinct characters from each other i also uh, you know returning to the point of elements of it that getting inside her head because there's a point that that i had made when i was on first steps where i had mentioned that i was sad that we did not get to see some of this on screen shout out to the ballroom dress uh i think we were personally robbed of that sleigh Uh, however however 
I think what doing this as a novel did, the show would not have been able to do, is get inside Asajj's head and Quinlan's mm. head in ways that you can't depict on screen. We got to see how Asajj thinks. We got to see how Quinlan thinks. And that's a big part of why this novel works so well because especially Asajj as a character is not going to come out and say I am feeling that my entire way of viewing things is conflicted especially since I am hiding dark secrets she's not going to she-hulk turn to the camera and be like let me explain my motivation to you they would have had to bring this across visually and and into the acting and I think it could have been done but I think it's more interesting to sit and see like oh here is what she thinks directly here is is how she I wonder if they could have played it let's put on the my favorite thing we like to do on this show which is what if they made this a tv show I think it would be interesting if they did this story in the aspect of Netflix is you where you have the character narrating over the action as it's happening but like no one's saying anything in the those sections where they're giving their thoughts. The actor's still emoting and still doing things, but they're like sharing their inner thoughts with you because you're somehow listening, being able to listen to their thoughts. I don't even know how it is. They're like talking to themselves, but they're really talking to the audience. And I don't know. I I I have not watched that show. Um, oh, you've never I'm seen s- you? No, I'm struggling. Really? My through, I'm struggling my way through Elite right now because you recommended it. And that show is right. so fucking bleak. Oh my God. I- <laughs> that show is bleak. I'm, su- I'm surprised you've never seen you though, because never that, seen you. I think you would like it. Um, just for the, I like the storytelling aspect of the. You know, you have this creepy person who is doing their inner monologue. It's very Dexter. It's the same, the inner monologue of the person, and then you know what I mean. Like they're just kind of right. talking us through what's happening and what they're feeling and stuff, and trying to go against their feelings. But then they also are going to kill people anyway because they're doing the right thing. I don't know. Whatever Dexter. You know what? About. You know what would be fun? You know what would be super fun? At the end of every, from a certain point of view, book, they have a wonderful short story, which is. <sighs> I'm hesitating on how much I want to actually say because they are fucking delightful and they are amazing if you land on them with absolutely no context. But it is two characters who are outside of the story discussing the events of the story after the fact. And I think that it would be very interesting to have get the narration of Asajj telling Mother Talzin Uh, in the Night Sister like communal afterlife the story of what happened. Oh, interesting. Because I think Son of Dathomir takes place before this. I think Talzin is already dead by the time this rolls around. Interesting. I was I was gonna think when you said that I instantly thought of oh well the plot device of the the show would just be Kenobi giving his report to the Jedi Council and then that is us going back and seeing the different aspects because it's he's you know how like in the end or whatever like he's kind of somewhat in this story and it's kind of like well, they show up throughout the story that the right. jedi council i was surprised the first time i read the book and i've read it multiple times but i was surprised the first time i read it just how big players the jedi council actually are in this right because Kenobi... and they're also huge fucking dicks oh well and kenobi yeah. actually calls them on it in this book right we just watched the um we just watched the the conclusion of season six and there's a bit where obi-wan's like well it wouldn't be the first time this council's been wrong about something recently at the conclusion yeah. of, of season six so hearing him like go off on the council and be like fucking everything you've done has been wrong with this situation this is your like uh i think this Book is important in showing how lost the Jedi are. And I think Asajj and her relationship with the Council throughout it is a very interesting depiction of that. I also like the idea of doing it that way because you can also have, you know, I mean, Mace Windu's in it. You can have Yoda and stuff. And so it's kind of like bring all these people back for this show. And, you know, we obviously know, you know, Kenobi's fine with being back and so it's like let's do you know samuel jackson come back and let's do you know what i mean like why not like let's just do it i personally i never would have said this before uh dark said divas covered it and then i got to watch my boyfriend watch this arc uh, i'm personally waiting for my mace windu survives it teams up with jar jar banks to solve mysteries <laughs> show i am dead fucking serious 
I am dead I... fucking serious. Go back and watch the disappear. <laughs> yes, it's the Jar Jar Fox arc, but it's honestly like way better than you remember it. Okay, I, I, I you know, it's been a long time since I've get a mod best and Samuel L. Jackson Wars, back. So. Uh, highly I highly mean, recommend doing it every couple of years. Uh, we yeah. we just finished season six and actually I have ground us to a halt. And I said, okay, your homework is go off, read Dark Disciple, read Son of Dathomir, and then we will proceed. Uh, are you actually going to finish the whole entire Clone Wars before you start Rebels? Or are you going to do like stop before he's the last already watched? And then... He's already watched Rebels. Oh, so oh, that's right. Doing... You started. That's right. You started. I with started Rebels. him on Rebels. That's then right. We watched that's right. Rogue One, the original trilogy. Then we watched Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones. We're in the Clone Wars. I've stopped him because I feel like Dark Disciple is such a necessary part to the story. I see. That I'm like, you got to read that before we continue. And also Son of Dathomir. Otherwise, you're going to be asking me a bunch of questions about why the fuck is Maul here? And what happened to Mother Talzin? Uh, and what's happening here? And then we're going on to Revenge of the Sith, Bad Batch, and then Obi-Wan Kenobi. And What about Solo? Where are you sticking that one in? We've already watched so okay. So here's the thing. Uh we were at brunch a couple of months ago. Okay, so we, there's no net rhyme or reason to your watching. Okay. There's no it. rhyme. Or, okay, <laughs> so here's basically what happened. Um, we were at brunch and we had many mimosas. And then we came home and we had several more mimosas and decided to watch a Star Wars movie because we were pleasantly brunch buzzed at this point. Of course. And so the fir- first first I, I almost put on Last Jedi. And then I was like, well, no, because I could put on this and I'll enjoy it, but he won't understand what the fuck's going on in this movie. Right. So I was like, okay, hit the brakes. Let's watch a movie that you can understand what's happening in it, but I also enjoy watching Blitz. <laughs> and so we put on Solo. Interesting. And I did cry at one point in it. <laughs> um, broke, I love that. Straight up broke down into tears during the, uh, the Kessel escape sequence. Uh, because I thought about how Chewbacca doesn't see his family for like 20 more years. And then I cried. Well, according to the... I am very fun to watch Star Wars movies with when I've had several mimosas. Because I get very into it. Well, I mean, he only waits like a few more years, right? Because when does Solo take place in like timeline-wise Solo to New Hope? Is, Solo is about eight years before New Hope. Okay, so he's only away from his family, theoretically, that we know of, for about eight-ish years. And then during the holiday special, he goes back and he sees the his holiday family. Spe- you d- then, listen, listen, you fucking... And then every listen, 30 years, twink. he goes back holiday special and sees listen, his family again. Bitch. According to the Lego holiday special, he goes back again with Ray and he sees his, like, his family again. So Listen, you, you pasty little fucking Southern gay boy. <laughs> I don't have time for your fucking bullshit right now. Oh God. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's, I was, I've been interested to, you know, get your thoughts as an Asajj death denier. Now that you have actually read the, the funeral uh, of Asajj, right. which I've been referencing forever and they lay her to rest and she turns into green mist and goes to join her sisters. I know you're not a fan of her dying, but what did you think of that sort of ending for the character? Okay, so what I like is I like the culmination of like her sacrifice, you know, to save Quinlan or whatever, because she she feels like I mean, she, not only does she love him, like she she admits that or whatever that she cares about him or whatever. Um, <laughs> she cares about him, whatever, like whatever she feels about him. Um, <laughs> whatever. I- <laughs> <laughs> You're such a cindere, oh my god. Right. I guess it, I guess I care about you, you piece of shit. But what's what's nice about it is that it, it proves not only that Quinlan is not evil, because she saves him because she's like, oh no, 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 he's worth saving. And then he kind of refuses to give in to the killing. Cause I think Duke is like, you know, he's like goading him. He's like, oh yeah, you should kill me now. Ha ha ha. Cause that's how Dooku likes to, he likes to tell people to kill him all the time, I guess to make people angry so that they give in to the dark side or something, but whatever. Anyway, that backfires on him spectacularly. Yeah. And the next, yeah, I was like in a couple of years, it's not going <laughs> to work someone out actually, you, but... It's a couple of months away. Oh, is it only book. months after this? We are months away from, oh, shit. from the events of Revenge of the Sith interesting okay we well months away in fact we we may actually have a canon answer to this let's let's look at our time yeah let's find, you yeah, finish your timeline? thought and yes, i will okay. look at the timeline of canon media so my i wasn't point gonna is, listen to you anyway right so my point is that when Asa- Asajj sacrifices herself essentially to save Voss, you know they kind of 
reconcile with each other and it's kind of one of those things where he's he you know he's holding her and she kind of essentially just dies in his arms very romantic um which i didn't think i would like the romantic aspects the adult aspects of this story but you know it's something that we don't get in star wars a lot like yeah I know- more people need to fuck in star wars okay i i'm serious i look somebody said recently on a podcast quoting someone else and i can't remember a who said it and b who they were quoting but they were like the only time sex happens in star wars is when somebody needs to make very important babies right you don't have to show it because like it is a saga for children however i think that elzar man said we should be allowed to fuck in star wars And then he did it. And you're not here because you didn't get to the rising storm yet. Yeah, no, I don't know what Uh, that means. Um, However, Elzar Man did say people who fuck rights. But no, I think that even if you don't out and out show it and you don't out tell kids like, yeah, they're absolutely boning. I do think that the sort of like steamy tension that Asajj and Quinlan have in this book is something that, and I don't know if that was the point you were actually making because I was engrossed in doing mental math. No, you're fine. But um, what I'm what I'm saying is like I like the idea of showing that kind of romance stuff, and then it also kind of goes into later on when they're taking her body back to uh, Dathomir uh, to lay her in the pool or whatever it is. I like that she kind of her spirit or whatever it is is like being welcomed back by the other Night Sisters, which in my head canon when I read that made me fast forward to rebels when what's this what's the little boy's name um ezra i don't know why i couldn't think of his name you mean the grown-ass teenager yeah um (laughs) i always think of him as season one i never think of him as like a teenager or adult well he's never an adult in the show well he will be in this upcoming thing he will Um, be he's gonna be be. sexy motherfucker in this upcoming god god Um, i hope they cast someone someone hot Okay, sorry, wait, I'm getting distracted. Okay, so what my point was is that in my headcanon, I think it's in the episode where Ezra opens up the dark, uh, the Sith holocron or whatever, he hears like a voice in the holocron and it's the same voice actress that does Asajj Ventress' voice. Right. Um, So in my headcanon, that is, it actually is Asajj. Interesting. Doing the voice. So she's still from the beyond guiding him. Like in- not in an evil way because it's not evil per se it's just the sith voice i don't know what it is i can't explain it but i i like the idea that she was ultimately reunited because i did actually look circling back i did look at our timeline of canon media mm-hmm. it looks like dark disciple is happening concurrently with darth maul son of dathomir so by the time she dies mother talzin is dead and with the exception of a few night sisters uh essentially asajj is the last one. so mm-hmm. i do think it's nice that she died and her whole story throughout clone wars is her trying to find a community and constantly having that community taken away from her so the fact that she was able to go home to the community that she chose because the night sisters is really the only community through the show that she chooses them and quinlan so getting to choose be with the sisters that she chose i think if you're going to kill her it's a very powerful ending i also did check this is happening in the same year as um, Revenge of the Sith. It does say that it happens prior to Clone Wars Season 7, but I don't know exactly how much... We're talking a couple of months, though. Mm -hmm. Um, Because Anakin is on Coruscant in Deal No Deal, and then in the Bad Batch, he's at the Outer Rim Sieges, and then in Revenge of the Sith, he mentions he's been at the Outer in the Outer Rim Sieges for long enough to not know that his wife is pregnant and she gives birth like 10 days later. Okay. So... We are we are a couple of months away from Revenge of the Sith. Got it. Okay. And so that's, I mean, obviously that's why she doesn't show up in Revenge of the Sith, other than the fact that they were not, they didn't put her in Clone War or Attack of the Clones, or they didn't put her in, you know, Revenge of the Sith because she came after Attack of the Clones. So it's, it would have been interesting to see her in the movie. I mean, I, I get that, like, t- like, they didn't create this story until after the movie came out, but... I still would have liked to see her in Revenge of the Sith because I never bought Grievous as Dooku's like quote unquote apprentice. Um, He was just kind of, he was just kind of there. He, he, he might've thought he was to some extent, but he, he never really truly was anything to Dooku. I don't believe. And I don't know. I just think 
it would have been an interesting story. Like, again, here come the what ifs. Like, if Star Wars ever does fucking what if, I would love to see a Star Wars what if. What if Asajj Ventress never died and essentially became whatever General Grievous was? Like, so there was no need for General Grievous. You just kept Asajj Ventress the whole time. And it would be interesting to see how Revenge of the Sith plays out if he still had his apprentice and they were theoretically successful in overthrowing the Republic. I don't know. It would just be an interesting thing to show. I mean, I think, honestly, if she's going to have a life outside of the novels and the cartoons, it's probably going to be a what if. And if not a what if, then they better give her her own fucking show. Like, I don't care what it is. I rarely agree with you on these points, but I I do agree on this. Would you like to hear my, my favorite Asajj Ventress fact? Yes, give it to me. So in Legends, they had written this whole Clone Wars multimedia project. And then they said, well, we're going to do the Clone Wars TV show. And in Legends, the Clone Wars TV show is canonical to Legends. And the problem is there are points where it started contradicting. And a big one is Asajj Ventress. She never left the Separatists in Legends. Uh, She stayed with them the entire time. Uh, And obviously in the show, she does. So the the Wikipedia had to reconcile this together. It is really funny to go on the the Wikipedia page, pages for some of these characters and watch them bend over backwards to try to make it make sense. My favorite of, of all is Asajj Ventress because in order to quote unquote die, at uh, Bot's Poi, I think is how it's pronounced. In order to die, quote unquote, die there, she does have to return to Dooku's service. So they summarize her role in the temple bombing and she departs. And then the next section is, for reasons unknown, Ventress had returned to the service of Count Dooku in the separatist movement. <laughs> uh, they were like, uh, okay. um, somehow Ventress returned. Love that. Which I think is the funniest fact about Asajj Ventress. Well, there's a lot that you can certainly discuss about this book. Uh, we have we have focused mainly on Asajj Ventress. Right. Because she is Bradley's favorite character. We did not cover much of Quinlan Voss. We did not cover much of the, the role of the Jedi in this book. We did not cover much of Dooku. Bradley, do you have anything in particular you want to bring up before we, we wrap yeah. it up? Um. Well, I guess I'll bring up the fact that they do name drop Quinlan Voss in Kenobi. We have talked about they this do. in our Kenobi episodes. I think now that they have done that, I think that's a great opportunity to go, ooh, maybe we do something with that character in live action because then you can have, like, re- like obviously Kenobi has been made and has already come out, but it would be interesting if they, let's say they go back and they make this into a, we'll call it the Quinlan Voss show. Uh, they take Dark Disciple and they turn it into a show about Quinlan Voss or something. It would be interesting to have that whole entire show happen And then you even have, you know, Kenobi in it for a little bit, like just as like a cameo. And same with Hayden Christensen, you have him in the, is a cameo with Anakin for a second. And then go back and you watch Kenobi after all this takes place. And then Kenobi says, oh, Quinlan's still alive and he's helping people with the path or whatever. It would enhance that little, what's now an Easter egg dialogue. You could turn it into like a, no, look, there's this whole entire thing that happened previously. I... Yeah, I like Dark Disciple as an origin story for him. Yeah. I think that, that again, there's very few times that people are say, I want an X show or I want a Y show. And 90% of the time I'm like, there's no material for that. There's no, what story are you going to tell with that? Quinlan, I think that story is there. And I think him realizing in Dark Disciple, you know, who he is as a person, what he wants to do, committing to his moral code. I think these are these are things that definitely feel like an origin story. And then, of course, we've now found out in Obi-Wan Kenobi, he is working with the path. Right. So I, I would if they do a path show, I would like to see him in it at the very least. I was going to say you could, I would do it one of two ways. I know I hate this trope of doing flashbacks, but if we don't get a, just a Dark Disciple show on its own, I would like to see a path show set after Kenobi where we focus on Quinlan and then he's flashbacking or dealing with the stuff that happened in dark disciple as he struggles with his moral you know whatever and um helping people with the path to kind of right the wrongs that he felt that he did you know um back then 
I don't know. It'd just be interesting to kind of have that because then at least I get to see Asajj Ventress in live action. There we go. Bit. Here's just a here little it comes. bit. Here but, it comes. Okay, here's my one thing about Quinlan that I'll say and then we can stop. Um, okay. So who the hell is going to play Quinlan Voss other than fucking Aquaman? Because I can't think of anybody else, unfortunately. And I don't know why I see that. No, now that you've said it, I, I can't see... I can't see anyone else doing I it. I don't want it to be him because I feel like there's plenty of people, but it's like, why is there's he? There's tons of people, but now that you've put the idea in my fucking why head. Why do I always see Jason Momoa as playing fucking Gwendolyn Moss? I don't know why. <laughs> That's what I see in my because brain. Because it works. Because it works, Bradley. It works so well. But it's such a typecast. Like, I don't want to do that to him. Like, I just, I feel like Quinlan deserves like somebody else. And I just feel like. Yeah, but also if the shoe fits, you know. Yeah, I know. But Sometimes it seems lazy casting. Sometimes for a reason. It seems lazy casting. That's what it seems like. It seems like I'm like a lazy casting director or whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, Jason Momoa, he can do it. He's got the you're, comedy You're like, chops, get me a Jason Momoa. Get me yeah. a Jason Momoa type. I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's definitely somebody out there who could also do it, but I just, I, I just, this is my go-to because I'm just like, it's an easy whatever. It does you work know. very, very, very well. I hate I feel like how he, well that works actually. He balances the comedy with the, you know, the action-y stuff. Like, I don't know. I just feel like it's perfect. So <laughs> unfortunately. Tune in for Dwayne the Rock Johnson as Quinlan Vaughn. No, 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 no. Definitely not. Uh, because that movie is going to turn into Fast and the Furious Star Wars, and I don't want to see that movie. I, I don't kind of want to see that movie. I don't want to see that movie. It's never going to happen. Please, God, no, please, no. All right. Well, folks, if you want to hear me talk in more detail about other aspects of this book, you can check out the Dark Disciple episode of our friends over at First Steps. I was the guest on their Dark Disciple episode. Uh, and then the plan for the next couple of weeks. And we're about to see a whole lot of each other. Yes, we are, unfortunately. A whole lot of each other. For the according next to couple. my schedule for the next couple of months, uh, oh. me and Charles are going to work all the way through basically uh, till next celebration. So basically next celebration will be my vacation we're not covering be, celebration next year i'm right. on vacation i will be at the grand californian getting drunk fuck yeah. you all i was gonna say i'll never talk about star wars again i'll never <laughs> I'm, i'll quit i'll be done Ugh. because we will have covered andor bad batch tales of the jedi mandalorian Jesus. season three by then we have to and, we have to oh, find and visions to probably we have to find somewhere to cram tales of the jedi in like oh my god i know and I've, seen, I, I've seen the first episode we will have things to talk about in tales yeah, that's of the what, jedi. i'm like oh why did they have to do this to us like can you not please just perfectly uh, segment everything like it Lord. would make my life so much easier <laughs> no because fuck us i guess i you know what i just I, I i'm at the point now like the top half of the year is so heavy with content i'm just afraid for what the rest of the year looks like because i don't know Ugh. like I mean, we just don't know why couldn't i have been unemployed like further back in the year that's what like, i'm saying me too <laughs> ugh, good lord uh so i actually heard bradley that some people got screeners of andor what yeah, I have heard whispers that some critics did actually get screeners in the first two episodes, which has never been done before. For a How is that shit not online already? <laughs> I don't know. I think they might have been very selective, but they like, must I have heard been. some people yeah. got screeners. We obviously didn't get any screeners. Yeah, you know what the I mean? hell, Disney? What the hell, Disney? We're a Star Wars TV podcast. Yeah, we, we, ex we basically exclusively cover TV shows and we always like them. So you should definitely give it to us because I'm going to give you good press. We'd never be critical at all. We would be like, oh yeah, Andor is the best thing that's ever I'm happened. Willing, since I'm willing to go back and edit all of our critical stuff out of our book of Boba Fett. Absolutely, 100%. I will go back and edit all of that out and just give me a big check and or let me see this stuff early. Or just invite us on set to like yeah, uh, season also, two uh, filming. That uh, let us see it. That'd Listen. Be great. Listen, if I ever met Genevieve O'Reilly, particularly if she's in hair and makeup and costume as Mon Mothma, I would simply become deceased. <laughs> I would I would simply cease to exist. Love that. You have no, you people, listen, I have a warning for Bradley and everyone else. 
you have no idea how much of a menace I am about to become about Mon Mothma. I am I about it. to become about Mon Mothma the way that Bradley would become if they made a show that had Asajj Ventress as one of the leads. Okay, I'm coming up with this now and we'll have to keep this going throughout all of Andor. I'm going to give you what I'm calling Mon Mothma Minute where I'm going to give you <laughs> one minute in every episode that we cover Andor to just go ham about whatever happened in the episode about Mon Mothma and then we'll be love like it. okay then we'll focus on plot and then we focus I love it. <laughs> yeah we're absolutely 100% doing that um, okay that great. will go well, I'm writing it down the, yep. the Mon Mothma, the Mon Mothma minute, Mothma minute. For, yep. for the start I will just gush about whatever it was that she did yep oh uh I don't want to say yet because at time of recording it hasn't come out but I was recently on another podcast the topic of Mon Mothma did briefly come up, uh, uh, yeah. but I believe in the next episode, because I don't like to say these things until they're out, on the next episode, I think the episode should be dropping this Friday if they adhere to their schedule. Uh, I will direct people to to a very good episode that I recorded on, on Lords of the Sith, the book. I am cool. quickly becoming the guy that guessed on your obligatory book episode. I mean, there Which you I'm go. I'm personally okay with. because You're I've the book guy. Basically, I'm the book guy now. So if you want me on your podcast, I've read all the books and comics. <laughs> I'm missing some junior novels, but that's it. I'm going to go read Guardian of the Wills so that uh, the Dark Side Divas Discord, when they keep referencing it, and I'm like, it's the one book I haven't read. I'm sorry. All righty. Well, Bradley, I will, uh, I will see you next week for Lego Star Wars, the Halcyon special okay <laughs> did, did, have you not seen the trailer for summer vacation i mean i barely saw it i did you know the, the lego ones are just kind of like i'm just like ah, i like to be surprised they go to the halcyon of course they do of course they fucking do <sighs> roll the socials please <laughs> thank you for listening to gold squadron gaze did charles fuck something up send us a message at gold squadron gaze at gmail.com Follow us on Twitter at Gold Squad Gaze. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Gold Squadron Gaze. Subscribe to us on YouTube at Gold Squadron Gaze, where we post the podcast as well as exclusive content. Please join us next week and every week for more of Gold Squadron Gaze. Sorry, it's like this giant ass fucking plane or whatever it is. Car. Oh, it's a train, I think. It's uh, a train. Train, 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 train. train. <laughs> you love hollow trains.